everyone, and welcome to On Point. I'm your host, Wayne Cavanaugh. The On Point format is pretty straightforward. It's a roundtable discussion with two experts and one topic. Today's topic is the classic sporting breed, the English Setter, one I grew up with, one of the many breeds I grew up with. Uh, and I'm joined today by two gun dog experts. I'm thrilled to have them. Dear old friends, we probably don't even remember how long it's been, and it should stay that way, I guess. We have Elliot Weiss, who, in my opinion, truly is on the short list of our generation's Billy Kendricks, and I mean that. And Eileen Hackett, who has won so many national specialty trophies that they could fill, or Will Alexander could take his losing <laughs> Toronto Maple Leafs tickets and put them, it, Eileen trophies are enough to hold all of Will's losing tickets. It's incredible, that's how many she has won. Sorry, Will, maybe next year, bud, love you. All right, how you doing, Eileen? Good, thanks. There are things in Pendleton, Indiana. Well. <laughs> well, that's how it should be, right? <laughs> I guess so. Any shows is coming up this weekend? Actually, English Center Specialties in Michigan. Well, see that? How that works, yeah. right? Perfect. The timing is pretty good. You know, we're, we've done this before. Elliot has things in Novelty, Ohio. One of my favorite names. Now that it stopped raining, things are wonderful. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Anyway. The name of the show is on point, and I want to get right to it. That's kind of the point, right? So the focus today is English Setters. I'm going to start off with a question for Elliot. Elliot, we've discussed this for years, as long as I can remember, uh, how important it is to learn all the setters to know about one. And maybe you can talk to us about the subtleties that make the setters different, the history of that, the function, and why it's so important in learning this essential breed. Wayne, let me start by telling you my pet peeve, and I think, I think that'll lead me into an answer. Yeah. I'm hoping it will. My pet peeve is watching people judge the setters as one variety instead of four distinctly different breeds, which they are. And they're not a variety divided by colors, as, as let's say cockers are, in, uh, American cockers. Years ago, Alva Rosenberg told me something I fully didn't understand at the time, but I, I, I think it was the hallmark of, of the setters. He said to understand one, you have to look at the history of all of them. Each one of these dogs was bred as a tool and was bred to do a specific job on a specific type of terrain. Uh, I think my sociology teacher would have called it, um, I'm having a senior moment, we, we would have called it geographical determinism. Exactly. So you have an Irish setter, which, which in the UK standard, the first line of the Irish setter says, must be racy. On the other end of the scale, the Gordon setter and the UK standard says should resemble as closely as possible a well-made hunter. And what they're talking about there is a very strong horse who could take a 200 pound man over fences for hours. In the middle, you have the English setter. You also have the red and white setter. The red and white setter says immediately must not be racy. Both of those dogs should be moderate because they were, they were bred to hunt in the most moderate country of the UK. Well, I take that back. The red and white setter was, bed, was, was bred to hunt in the, in the peat bogs in Ireland, not the open fields that the red setter was bred to, to hunt in. One of the most important lines in the English setter standard, in my mind, that people pay little attention to is on the general characteristics it states. I'm not, I, I think I can quote it correctly, but the gist of it is this. Let me get it straight in my head. The gist of it says extremes in either direction should be severely mm -hmm. penalized. And what the English setter standard means by that is they don't want an Irish setter and they don't want a Gordon setter. They want something in the middle and it must be moderate. I think this is totally overlooked in our country to a great extent. And you have people going, 
flying around the ring. And as long as it flies around the ring and it's flashy, it wins. Even though it couldn't, even though you could probably paint it red and show it an iris set of ring right. at the same time. Yep. Absolutely couldn't agree anymore. Eileen, I think you're probably on board with that, right? Yes, I agree with that. I think the word moderate's used in all three standards in the United States. Um, but I think moderate is, is a word that you need something to compare it to. Exactly. And that's perfectly said. So you would think, are there any examples you can think, Eileen, of how you would define these, these I mean, let's, let's just go with the ones we see all the time, the Irish and the Gordon and the English setter. You, there are three different, I think of them as three, three different dogs in scope, bone, substance, everything, right? Yeah, absolutely. With the Irish setter being, Elliot, you had it, you had an analogy about this, right? Didn't you talk about um, race horses or, or draft horses or something like that? When, when we made the, when we redid the, the, edu the judge's education years ago for the English setter, we, we used bicycles and we used horses. You don't want a thorough, a racy thoroughbred, and you don't want a draft horse. Right. You want something in the middle, like a Morgan or a, or a quarter horse. Right. So the Irish setter being the thoroughbred, the Gordon setter being the draft horse, and somewhere in the middle for the English setter. Eileen, and, and that and that's an extremely extremely concept that's not that's rarely followed. Yep, absolutely. They're all looking the same sometimes. Eileen, what do you think? I agree. I think that the um, English would be the Lakeland and the Irish would be the uh, Wire Fox and the Gordon would be the Welsh Terrier. Yeah. I mean, the same sort of thing. And it's really well put. to understand these differences because we see it all the time. It's crossing over. And I remember being at George Austin's kennel one day and for Gordon Setters, it was Torrance of Ellicott and... Um, Legend of Gale. And they look nothing, nothing like the Gordon Setters of today. Nothing. English Setters, however, when I go back to Rock Falls Colonel, and that's going way back, right? Um, I think it win today. He, he, yeah. I, I, they're so different. Um, and Irish Setters, Milson Oboy, he wouldn't even be able to finish today, yet he had his own following in the New York Times. So it's about getting back to the specifics of each breed and what defines them. I really think it's important that we um, thoroughly understand anybody going to breed or judge these that knows how different they really are and why. I mean, if you've ever been to the Irish mountains, and I have with Irish setters, and watch those things, I mean, it's wide open, no tree, and it's rough, rough terrain. And those things can fly and they run. All, there was an Irishman who told me they run 100 miles, you know, every time they hunt. Um, Maybe an exaggeration, but you get the point, right? English mm -hmm. setters are going to work in a whole different country, a uh, different cover. And then Gordon setters are going into the thick bramble and, and need that substance. And we're just not seeing that consistently, in my mind. Um, Eileen, are, are you concerned about those things as well? Yes, yes. I think that right now in the show ring, it's just whoever runs fast. It doesn't matter. You should be able to walk a dog and still see its length of stride. I mean, right. but right now what's getting rewarded, I think more and more is the faster you go, the better they like it. Yeah. And to achieve that, where have we cheated in confirmation? To achieve that. I think you get lighter, less bone, less size, mm -hmm. um, longer bodies maybe. Mm -hmm. And we see it in a lot of sporting breeds, right? Longer back. Oh, I think so. Shorter Longer leg. Back. Run shorter back. leg. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, when you look at, at the uh, field trial pictures of, of English setters, or you watch them, which is so much fun to do, they're a real moderate shaped dog. They're almost. Right. And, but uh, I think the word moderate shouldn't equal mediocre or, no, or plain. generic right. or plain. Right. I mean, I think there still are. The English setter should be an elegant dog and a, a very attractive animal. Yeah, very much so. Elliot? Wayne? Can you hear me? I, I can't tell on this anymore. Yep. 
I think the most important thing is to get a picture in your mind. And the most important thing is to look across the ring, see a dozen English setters in front of you, let's say. And the most important thing is going to be proportions and you're going to know who's in competition in a minute. You see it. Yep. You walk down the line and you look at the bone and you look at the head and you know what's moderate and you know what's in competition at that particular time. I don't think most people get that. I don't but it's unfortunate. You well, you have to see a good one, right? And you have to, and this is an English setter story, but Eileen, I think you'll enjoy it too. It had to be 40 years ago. I was sitting in Elliot's kitchen and there were Chesapeake Bay Retrievers in the back, in the, in the yard. And I was struggling with the outline, the basic shape of Chesapeake Bay Retrievers for me. I'm sure everyone else thought I had it. I wanted to be, I wanted to really get that ingrained. I wanted to know it inside out. And we're discussing it. And I look out the window and I see this bitch he had, a Chesapeake Bay Retriever bitch. And I looked and I thought, that's it. Is that, am I, is that it? And Elliot and we're both, yes, that's, and that, with those moments, those spark moments, um, define that image in your head. And if you haven't seen one, or if you've seen the wrong one, that's doing a ton of winning, that's your template. Right. So where do you go to get those things, you know? Um, I grew up, well, we all grew up in the Northeast, right? Right. Um, so in my mind, it was Mary Rover Valley Run, uh, Candlewood's Dynamite. Um, later, later on, um, uh, Arundel's Duke of Norfolk might not have been the best fronted dog, but oh, his headpiece was glorious. And those dogs, to me, define sort of the making shape I have in my head. Um, and depends, well, they should. Yeah, yeah. And, and that to me was pure English setter. And if you go back and look at those pictures, look at those heads. We've lost so much there, um, and and it's just changed. Um, when you go back and look at Ludar Blue Bar and the Colonel and so many of those dogs, you see some features that we could really use today, but I'm not sure they'd be appreciated today. What do you think? I think they would. You think? Oh, I think they would. Yeah. I think they would. Yeah. By the way, I think you know if you see a dog like the Colonel going around, or just standing there in the picture, mm -hmm. that should be an aha. Yes. That should be the proportions, the length, the back. The, the planes on the head, you could see, you, you don't even have to put your hands on them. You, you see the matching angles both ways. Right. He was, I think he could win today. I really do. Uh, I, I wonder if his, all his parts would be appreciated. That headpiece was beautiful. Parallel planes, top and bottom, um, and just so squared and chiseled in a nice way. Not too wet, not too dry. Um, and that's, you know, Mary Rover had the same sort of head. Um, those are things that I'll never forget. Eileen, you grew up in the same area we did. And I remember, no, oh, I think it was 2,000 years ago, you came to the ring with an English setter that didn't look like any of the English setters. And we've talked about this before. Uh -huh. Want to talk about it a little bit? Um, sure. I was in the Northeast, and I had a West Coast dog. And mm -hmm. it didn't look like any of the rest of them. Right. I, I came from Irish setters, and... You know, the racier ones kind of attracted me, to, were more attractive to me than the big heavy-headed. To me, they were heavy-headed. They were probably more correct-headed. But so I went to the West Coast and got a guy's and dolls dog because Shalimar Duke was my very favorite English setter ever that I ever saw. And that's what I wanted. Um, so that's where I went and got my foundation. And they had tremendous front ends and beautiful top lines. But they were lacking in head, absolutely. Um, but when I graduated from college, my mother got me a um, Polpiro bitch, which had a beautiful head, not the strongest back. Um, and I think, you know, I, from that is, is kind of where I went, uh, trying to improve my head and bone, make them maybe a little less racy, a little more moderate but retain the, the top line and the uh, front angles that the guys and dolls had. Yeah, I think I, at the time, I don't know how conscious it was for me watching you do that, but it was clearly a thing like this West Coast invasion was weird to us. I remember being in an English, especially in New Jersey, and Shalimar Duke came out and we all were waiting to see the great one. You walked in and we went, 
what is that? We didn't even know what it was. And it took us years to appreciate all he had to offer. Right. And one thing we did not have back East was fronts. Didn't right. have them. Gorgeous heads, gorgeous bone and substance and body and type. Right. right make good proportion. But our fronts in the rain weren't a pretty thing to see. And, rain? Uh, yes, Elliot. Do you remember Taste the Honey? Yes, yes. Guys and Dolls Taste the Honey. She had, I think, she was the first picture I saw come back from the coast that I, I really, really loved. Early on, you're talking about those guys. Yes, right. yes. Very early on. And they were more closely related. Shalimar Duke, on his sire side, had three crosses to Ludar of Blue Bar. And he looked nothing like them, right? He, on his distaff side, he had three crosses. And this is in three generations. He had three crosses to Rock Falls Colonel. Right. So fairly inbred sire and dam. And he didn't look a whole lot like either right. of those dogs, but he did combine some features and produce them down the road. Produce them, yeah, I think so too. Yeah. I think he, I think he was. I loved the dog, but I think he was a better producer than he was himself. Yeah, yeah, but he sure was flashy. Oh, beautiful! I can see your Myers. I can see that attraction. Eileen, do you agree the early guys and dolls dogs were a better picture in your eye than the later ones? Yes, yes. And you, you see, I think, I think I attribute that to, Wayne, to his first wife because the second wife kept breeding orange to orange to orange and they got more Irish cedary, in my opinion. The first ones I thought were gorgeous yeah. and, and did a lot for the breed. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I think they went out more um, later on. Yes, and, yes. And I'll cross more. Yeah. Instead of staying with what he had. Yeah. Well, you took them and improved them tremendously, what you got. Well, I don't know that I improved them, but I I think I kept what I loved about them and and changed what I wanted to change about them. I think that the guys and dolls bitches, the early years, the bitches. You could have bred them to a dingo and they would have produced an English letter. I, I mean, agree. I think they were so prepotent for um, English letter uh, that his bitches were just, I thought, remarkable in their production. In every way, you're correct. I agree 100%. And that goes back to. And they were very English. Very English. Time. Very English type, yes. And it makes sense because yes. you're stock full of stone gables, uh, not stone, well, some stone gables, but uh, back to Colonel, back to Ludar Blue Bar. And Blue Bar, you know, that was a kennel that was so incredibly important in this breed. Oh, absolutely. And, and then the Silver Mine dogs and Wagabond and all those dogs that came out of that, uh, that generation. And it almost seemed to, when I think of it now, I'm just thinking it, it sort of unraveled a little bit and then came back together. And, and I think Eileen did a great job of combining those two. And Elliot had some beautiful dogs um, that really uh, captured both of the same thing. I mean, the East Coast dogs that, that we all grew up with, the Claro dogs who I grew up with and loved and owe so much to, um, uh, those dogs had a lot of those features that we all liked on the East Coast. And then Elliot's stuff started to bring together Again, strong top lines, beautiful heads, and he got him going too. And I remember, I don't know what year it was, Elliot, but I was doing the, the English Setter National and I gave you winner's dog or best of winners. I think it was winner's dog first. I probably just did dogs. And, um, and that was a dog that filled my eye. Um, you remember him, Eileen, the blue dog? I do, a blue dog. Blue um, dog, correct, Shoby, we call it. Shoby, yeah, yeah. I think it was called Winsworth's Reflection. Yeah. But you didn't show them off. You see, you see, Wayne, I like the I like the dogs at that particular time back in the East Coast, but they didn't have enough breed character for me. And, I, and now that I said that, I think I better explain that. Yeah. Kay Monahan bred a dogs, bred dogs under the prefix of K Don that I thought were beautiful, beautiful English setters. 
They had no guts. George, George Austin and I used to talk and say, if you find a good one, show it six times because it's not going to like the show after that. And when I moved out to Idaho and, and Debbie and I started breeding dogs together, I said, if we could find a K-Dom bitch, because she asked me what I liked. And I said, I like the look of those K-Dom bitches back east. But I don't like their breed character. They need it hard. And she said, well, everything you're putting up is you're putting up by Haji, the um, Setteridge, uh, Setteridge. Um, solid gold. That's it, solid gold. So she she told me, well, they have a they have a K Dom bitch there, and I said, well, what are they going to do with it? And she says, you're going to breed it the Haji. So we called up and, and combined the two, and that's where we started from. But most of the stuff back east that that K Monahan had also had a lot of guys and dolls in it, and Stone Gables too. And there's a lot, there's a lot of Clarho too. And then from that, from one of Cade, one of uh, the Caden came on hands. There was uh, lots of dots, um, who was who did a lot of winning. She was a smaller bitch, but she had guts. She could go. Yeah, she did. Lots of dots was very, very, very pretty. I thought. Yeah, and she had wheels too. And you know, there's that. Mm. I remember hearing these discussions um, from my dad and, and folks of that era saying. Hey, the English setters are gentlemanly. We don't want them flying around the ring. And I thought, yeah, you do. Just a little bit, you do. <laughs> not like an Irish setter, not at all. But you do want a little guts if you're gonna if you're gonna. Oh, it's show them. dogs. They should be able to show. Yeah. Show dogs. Emphasis on the dogs for me, right? But still, right. I've got to be able to get. The ring and put well, on I've got to take my hat off to Alina now because I think she had the right combination together to do that. Yeah. Eileen, your dogs you know, show like English setters. I think they do, um, but I I did sort of the same thing. I took a um, the uh, stargazer bitch of the skulls and leased her and bred her to my dog, who I think was a good dog, but maybe not the tightiest English setter, my Ross dog. And um, I think that Maisie the bitch was a beautiful type bitch. Um, but not as strong a mover. And when we combined them, we got, I think, the best of both. Oh, you know, the, you breed for uh, virtues, right? Yeah. I think it's too easy to get caught up in the faults um, when you're breeding. I think you've got to look at the overall picture. I think it's too easy to get caught up in the faults when you're judging also, mm -hmm. and too many people do it. Oh, I, mean, I agree. Let, let, let's face it, the best dog in the ring may not have the best hindquarter in the ring. Right, right. And I think our standard's pretty clear about that, but no one fault should be taken greater than the whole, um, which I think is kind of an important thing to Correct. keep in mind for judges, which doesn't always happen. Um, I mean, I don't like high tails, but it's just one piece of the whole. You know, I don't like a light eye but it's one piece of the puzzle correct well said remember uh my dear dear late friend jim edwards who is such a construction guy you know being a biologist and a zoologist uh he approached dogs from, we used to say from the inside out and me from the outside in and uh i had a dog with not a great tail at one point and he said and i'm a tail guy heads and tails are very important in every breed to uh -huh. me very important and he said, if you have to go that far back to find the first fall, Kavanaugh, just give it up. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. Now, what dogs do you think from the past, Eileen, uh, do you have as a model uh, when, you, when you're putting your pieces together? Or dogs? It may be some you didn't even own or had nothing to do with. Oh, I think there, there are all kinds of English setters. I think English setters are in good shape right now. I think you can go any place in the country and find a good one. Um, I think that people are, are more conscious now of, of type. Um, and I think that, that everybody's trying maybe a little bit different. I think sometimes they get caught up on health issues, um, which I think are important, but shouldn't be the driving force in a breeding. 
Um, if you know what you're doing. If you know what you're doing, yes. Yes. I mean, I think that um, hip dysplasia was a big problem in our breed for a long time. And it's less of a problem now. But if I had a dog whose hips didn't clear and I liked everything else about him, I would use it. I mean, judiciously, I'd use it with a dog that had good hips. But I think people get caught up in the little things rather than the overall picture. Um, and I think that today, few people can recite pedigrees um, or have an idea of what's behind what they have. Um, maybe that's because we're not sitting down writing out the pedigrees anymore. We can just press a button and it all comes up. And the percentages of who's who in the zoo is listed as well. Um, so you don't have to really study your pedigrees as much. Um, I had someone come to me that wanted to breed to one of my stud dogs and I asked who her bitch was out of and she said, oh, Jack and Jill. And I said, well, who are Jack and Jill, Sire and Dam? And she couldn't tell me. I mean, and I said, well, unless you know intimately at least three generations, I don't think you should be breeding. And, and I don't mean that in a negative way, I just think that a lot of people don't do their research. Um, when uh, the little girl that works for me uh, wanted to breed her bitch, I made her sit down and, and write out pedigrees on three by five cards, put them on the kitchen table in the pedigree fashion, and go and research each of the dogs in the pedigree. Well, how do I do that? Well, call the people, email the people who owned them or handled them and ask them what the dogs were like so that you have an idea of what's behind your animal so then you can go forward when you breed her. Um, and I think that that doesn't happen a lot. I think people see either the popular stud dog of the day or the popular winner of the day and that's who they want to breed to. And that's not always the smartest way to go about it. But that's just me. No, I think you're right on target. Running and the money. I never thought of it, Eileen, but we did have to handwrite our pedigrees. Right, and right. And that did connect us more to the names and the memories. That's an excellent Well, idea. and I think that our English Center annuals used to have way more um, stud dog and brood bitch uh, advertising. And now it's more who won what specialty or who won what best in show. And not to, to make that less important. I think that's it. Obviously, you're proud of it. You're bragging about it. But the pedigrees and, and who's behind those animals should be something that you're equally proud of. Absolutely. Elliot, what do you think about how we're going today with... Um, well, first of all, I want to say that and I think we'd all agree, there are a lot of good English setter breeders right now. And oh, absolutely. It sounds like we're saying Eileen's the only one who's figured out this magic potion. We really do have, and I agree with you, Eileen, especially right now, there's, you know, there'd be periods of time where you couldn't find a good one. And now mm -hmm. we have a pretty good spread. And also, the differences between the East Coast and West Coast are gone. I think we blended, and there was a Midwest too, Hidden Lane's yes, Bench. Yes, those right. Well, right. That's why we didn't look anything like either of the coast dogs, right? And right. I think we blended that pretty well together. Maybe that's because airplanes and semen and travel, I don't know. And sure. Wayne, but, I don't think you should it. forget Canada. Yes. Canada has, exactly. Canada has excellent English set of breeders. Oh, yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think Australia's got some good English set of breeders. I mean, I think oh, that, absolutely, too. I think worldwide, our breed is, is, in, good, is in good shape especially as compared to, dare I say, the other setter breeds. Um, what, it, what, it, what interests me, Eileen, I don't know if you would agree with me, but over the last 20 years, the Europeans are liking the American style. For yes, the first time. I think so for the first time, yes. Years, yes. Ago, we, years ago, you sent an American dog there, they'd look at it like a, it was a different breed. Right, right. I think they're appreciating it more now. Mm -hmm. Definitely. There's one exception to that, and it was an extraordinary exception. I couldn't agree anymore. But back in the 70s, Sally Howe had a Clarahoe bitch named, I'm going to forget her name now, but uh, she was small. Uh, 
beautiful bitch, maybe the best one she ever bred. And Bill and Hilda Parkinson were over visiting Ralph Del Deo, pointer friends. The Parkinsons were giants in the pointer world, Davium pointers in England, and in every club and very high profile people. They, they bought this little bitch back to England. We thought, she doesn't look like anything. Ever. And they tore it up. Was it because <laughs> of, of <laughs> how it was brought over in that cool show? I don't know. But it really did. It was striking the differences. And I think you're right, though. They are getting a look back now at, at what's here. And that's pretty exciting, I think. And in a testament to, to the great number of breeders we have here, like Elliot said, in Canada. Yes. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Anything right now you're seeing that interests you, Elliot? Not naming dogs, but um, as far as what we're seeing in confirmation in English setters opposed to the other setters. Is it pleasing to you? Are you finding those dogs when you judge these days or more? I of find them? a big dichotomy. Yeah. I find, I, I go down a line. I, I look across the ring, go down a line. I'll, I'll say, wait a minute. This, 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 I could paint this one red and show it in an Irish setter ring. And I really object to that. Yeah. On the other hand, on the other hand, there are a lot of moderate, dogs in there that deserve to be there and deserve to win. And sometimes they do. Yeah, there's there's an Irish setter right now that just puzzles me. I think it's a great dog. Will thinks it's a great, I saw this dog, I called Will and he said, oh no, I, we're the only two that love it. He can't really win much because he's kind of moderate, but he's a good one. And that does happen in these setter breeds, right? As far as, um, as far as you're not seeing the Gordon setter type of English setter, are you, Elliot? You're seeing more towards Irish than Gordon. I see more. Yeah, we see. I see more towards Irish. And in fact, well, I'll tell you a quick story. I have a, a good dog man came over from another group, started judging sporting dogs, and he came to me and he said, "What do you think of the Gordon setter I just sent in?" And my answer to him was. I could, you could paint it a different color and show it as an English. It just wasn't gordon -y enough, but it flew around the ring. Instead of showing strength and stamina, it showed speed. And that's a problem we have in the country with a lot of breeds, I think, Wayne. Yeah, I think, you know, we've, angulation is a pretty thing, uh, but moderation is the word. Um, and Gordon Setters to me, well, there's some beautiful ones out there. Let's say that right up front. But when they have too much behind their tail, it doesn't remind me much of a Gordon Setter. And there's a okay. lot of dogs on that tail. Exactly, exactly. Um, but exactly. What do you think, if, if you're going to go back and start, and start all over again in English Setters, or better yet, if you were looking, if someone came to you and said, I want to start in English Setters, I want to buy a brood bitch first, what would you tell them to look for confirmationally in substance and character and everything else for that foundation? Would it be a top winning looking dog or would it look like a brood bitch, Elliot? What would you look, what would you tell someone to look for? You know, <laughs> I was reading about, about peaks. Um, Bill Taylor said this once and I love this statement. He said, if I want a good peak brood bitch, I want something that's built like a truck driver and has a face like a lady. <laughs> that's um, brilliant. The bitch Eileen just showed last year that, that she did a lot of winning with. If I could get that bitch and say, this is a, this is a foundation bitch for somebody, it will be fabulous because of the pedigree and the way the bitch was and the way she was put together. You're not looking for the... I mean, it's got to be English setter. You didn't care if it would be a top winner if it had a lot of hair or anything else. It's got to be an English Oh, it could have a lot of hair, but it, does, but it still has to be an English setter to me. Right. I right. It's, it's got to have, it's gotta have the right amount of bone, the right amount of body. Uh, it's got to have a hard top line with a rib cage that carries right back. So the length is not in the loin, but it's in the strength of the rib cage itself. Absolutely. There you go. What do you think about uh, the same thing, Eileen? What would you tell people to look for in a foundation bitch? I, I would first say um, to look at the pedigree. I mean, I think oh, you, absolutely. I think that to so many people go out and get a brood bitch, um, and the pedigree's a complete outcross. And unless you know what direction you want to go in, I think, why would you do that? 
I mean, unless you knew you wanted to tighten up the pedigree with a particular dog that is highly line bred on one side or the other. Um, I just got an email from a gal that wanted to know if she could lease a bitch from me to breed to her stud dog. She didn't even send me a pedigree of the stud dog at first, so I asked her for a pedigree, and it was a complete outcross, and it had nothing of any of my dogs in the pedigree. I mean, nothing. And so I told her, you know, she, she doesn't need a brood bitch from me. She needs to go find a brood bitch that would complement her dog, which is kind of a backwards way of doing it, in my opinion, anyway. But that's what she was looking for. Um, so I would, I would look at pedigrees first and then go for the same things. Elliot said, you want something that looks like an English setter that's deep in body and, and it's got not the length of back carried in the loin. Um, a pretty face. I like dark eyes, so I, I guess I grew up, Ray Chase told me never to get into light eyes, that they'll haunt you forever. And I kind of kept that in the back of my mind. Um, I think it's one of the reasons I don't aspire to judge, because I'm kind of too narrow-minded in what I like and I don't like. And it's not necessarily... Um, the way it should be. I should look at the whole thing rather than just a piece, but that's a piece that, that bothers me a lot. Um, I want to see that soft expression. I think with a yellow eye, you don't see a softness to their faces. Um, so those would be the things I'd look for. Well, I think if anybody's interested in getting into this breed, you couldn't find two better sources than the people we have on here today and Elliot and Eileen. Um, one th quick thing on color. Do you think if you stick with one color too long, you start to lack things? In pointers, you just if we don't have more livers in that breed, we're going to lose so much. You've got to cross the colors in pointers. You think the same thing is true in English setters about colors? I do. I definitely do. Um, in the early days, well, let's go back to Guys and Dolls, because he was a very famous kennel that really stamped something at and did a lot for the breed itself in the early days. They had blues mixed in. I don't think when, when, when his second wife did not like blues at all and they started becoming more fine. I think you have to mix it two. I think if you breed blue to blue to blue, you're going to wind up heading toward a Gordon-y exactly. type dog with, with heavy bones, heavy head. And I think if you breed orange to orange to orange to orange and you're not careful, you're going to get racy in it. I'm not, I'm not saying you have to breed a blue to an orange, but you, you could find a stud dog, let's say an orange stud dog that's beautiful that may have had a blue mother. Correct. Yes. Yes. You know, I'd mix them up that way. But I, I don't, I think if you go one color and one color and one color, well, Wayne, you and I have talked about it ages and point is the same thing is going to happen. You're going to go too far in one direction and Less than another. I agree. And I love a pretty try too. You know, um, we don't see as many as we used to. Um, certainly back east, we used to see quite a few. Well, anything else we, we're going, I could go on all day with you two and we probably will someday <laughs> when we get together in a real room, but I've enjoyed this so much. I've learned, I hope we all have. Any final thoughts, Elliot, on the breed today? And what- Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna list the three things I think are most important. First of all, it's overall proportions. Secondly, one thing that I think is 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 not looked at enough is called breed character. For instance, you can have an absolutely breathtakingly beautiful English setter, but if it goes around in a ring with its tail between its legs, it shouldn't get an award. Right. It should be comfortable. It's it's a breed. Well. Eileen and I both started more more in Irish setters. She had she had a gorgeous bitch. I loved at the time years ago. Uh, I'm not going to say how many years ago because we go back a lot of years <laughs> together. But the tail has to be wagging. They have to be bright eyed. They have to look at you and saying, "What do you want next?" They have to be very biddable. And and thirdly, I'll go for mechanics. I'll forgive a dog if it doesn't come and go 100% if it has other qualities. Exactly. 
I remember specifically where we mentioned the dog's name. Elliot gave it a giant award, and uh, someone said to me, well, I don't understand. It wasn't so clever behind. And I said, so what? I mean, <laughs> she had so much breed type and character. Oh, I know she who you're beautiful. talking about. She's beautiful, yeah. yeah. Sensational. And yeah, they they were, and yes, yeah, I would want to improve a hind quarter, but so what? We can get other virtues. Yeah. Right. Exactly. No fault judging. Eileen, how about your final thoughts on what we, what's going on in English setters and what you like? Well, I think that um, Elliot's right. The proportions should be considered, but unfortunately, our standard doesn't hmm. outline what proportions, height to length. Um, the Gordon Setter standard says it should be square. Our standard doesn't address height to length. So I think sometimes that's a little bit difficult for judges to assess, but the parts that are there should all work in harmony. And um, that would be something I would want people to keep in mind. And it, and it should look like an English setter, not an Irish or a Gordon. Great. This has been wonderful, guys. Uh, if the world saw our technical foibles in the beginning of this, it would be a great YouTube video. <laughs> but I think it was well worth it. I can't thank you both enough. You know, we have great admiration for both of you. And um, it's just been wonderful to be here. I almost feel like you're in, are in your living room. Have a great day. Thanks again. Okay. I appreciate this very much. Thank, thank you, Elliot. Thank you, Eileen. Thanks, Wayne. Thanks, Wayne. Take care. Bye. Bye now. How do we get out of here? <laughs>